Good morning, Compass. Good to see everybody. There's uh, two announcements today. Uh, the one, first one is the young adult class or youth class will be meeting, uh, the SAP school class will be meeting at 10 every Saturday. So if you're just now coming for that, you missed it. Um, and it's across the parking lot there. Uh, the second announcement is that that was the only announcement we have. So that's a good announcement. <laughs> All of them, okay. Right, that's. From kindergarten through me. Okay, to you, because you're <laughs> yeah. still a young adult. What is that, dinosaur? In mind. <laughs> well, we're glad everybody came. Um, it's been a crazy couple of weeks there. And uh, one of the reasons that we moved to Arkansas is because we don't want to live in Minnesota. But apparently Minnesota came to us this last week, so. Don't kid yourself. Hey, Doug, where, <laughs> where's Doug? Oh, you're kind of a weather nerd um, like me. Was 13 below, is that, the, is that a record? It's not? Wow, even colder, okay. 17? Okay, let's not repeat that, but I'm all about perspective, so you know, our pipes didn't freeze, and I'm very happy about that. I have a cousin in um, Portland, and she's been without power for nine days now. Uh, they finally hooked up some generators, uh, so they're heat, and the kids are excited because they have an Xbox back, but. Um, you know, there's so many people in Texas now that are still without power, and it's just a, it's a train wreck down there, and we're just really happy that it's going to be 40 today. I'm very excited about that. Um, so today we're starting our series on the Holy Spirit, and uh, Megan is going to uh, speak with us today. So let's just lift her up in prayer right now. Father God, we're so thankful uh, to be here today, and that the weather is going to warm up and that we made it through this cold snap, and hopefully there's not another one. And we just pray for all the people, Lord, that are out of power and that are suffering during this, and we're just so blessed to, to be where we are and to have power and electricity and, and just warmth, warm places to stay and warm cars to get into. And Father God, we just lift Megan up today and just open our hearts to receive the message on the Holy Spirit and to, to fill this place with the Holy Spirit so that we are receptive. Be with the praise team, Lord. Um, just help them to also portray the Holy Spirit through song and just uh, bless us all today. And we love you and we thank you for all these things. Amen. Amen. And uh, we're actually doing the children's story first. So if the little, little children would like to come up and uh, Claudia is going to have her story for us. Come see me, children. We have a story for you. Hello, hello. Good morning, happy Sabbath. Do you ever get thirsty? Do you ever get thirsty? When you get thirsty, what do you like to drink? What's your favorite thing to drink when you get thirsty, Theo? Do you have a favorite thing? What about you, Fallon? Water, you know what? Water is my favorite thing to drink. Always. Even when I go to a restaurant, I get water. So I'm going to show you a bunch of different things that I have in my cupboard at home. Well, they're not in my cupboard at home right now. They're here. What are all these things used for? What do you think? They're all cups. What can you put in them? You could put water in them, you could put juice in them, because when we're thirsty, water is a really good thing to have on hand, isn't it? Do you think Jesus ever got thirsty? You don't think so? When he lived on our earth, do you think Jesus ever got thirsty? I believe he did, because there's a story in the Bible about Jesus going and meeting a woman at the well. And all of the disciples went into the town, and Jesus stayed at the well. And a woman came to the well, and do you know what Jesus asked her for? He asked her for a drink of water. And she was kind of confused, because she was a woman from a different country, and she was a Samaritan woman, and the Jewish people didn't like the Samaritans very well. And so she was very surprised, because Jesus spoke to her. 
and asked her for water. And so she said, why are you asking me, a woman and a Samaritan, for water? And he said, do you know that if you knew who I was, you would be asking me for water, and I would give you living water, and that living water, you would never be thirsty again. Can you imagine having water that if you took a drink of that water, you would never be thirsty again? What kind of water do you think Jesus was offering her? Do you know? When Jesus sent us the Holy Spirit, he gave us water that will never go away because Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to us to fill us with his presence so that we can serve him and be like him and do what he asks us to do. And that's the kind of water that Jesus was offering the woman at the well. Did you know that? So when you take a drink of refreshing, cool water, I want you to think about the water that Jesus offers us so that we'll never be thirsty again. Can you do that? Okay, let's have a prayer. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for loving us enough to send us the Holy Spirit and giving us water that will refresh us and make us more like you so that we will serve you and, and love you and be like you. I pray that you will be with us through our service today. Amen. You can go back to your seats. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. Nothing can compare. You are our living hope. Your presence, Lord. I taste it. Of the sweetest of loves, where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone. Your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are. i 
Father in heaven, we do invite your presence here, but not here to this building, for you do not dwell in temples made with hands. We invite you back to the temple that you made to inhabit, that you made, Lord, that you made special after your own image. And though we don't feel worthy, we certainly don't feel temple-like. We humbly ask, Lord, that you would inhabit what you've purchased, where you deserve to be, enthroned here, Lord, in us. Not compass, but me. Be here, Lord. We wait to hear from you in your name. Amen. Stand with us as we sing. Yes. 
See you. 
On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let everyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. If you've ever heard the phrase, the Holy Spirit, and you want to know what it means, where do you start? Well, In the tabernacle. And we also see God's Ruach empower a group of people called the prophets. They're able to see what's happening in history from God's point of view. That's exactly right. And here's the problem as the prophets saw it. While God's Ruach had created a really good world, humans have given in to evil. They've unleashed chaos into it through their injustice. A new type of disorder. Yes. And the prophet said the spirit would come, just like in Genesis 1, but now to transform the human heart to empower people to truly love God and others. How will this new act of God's Spirit happen? Well, centuries pass and we are introduced to Jesus. And at the beginning of his mission, there's this beautiful scene where Jesus is being baptized in the waters of the Jordan River. Yeah, the sky opens up and God's Spirit comes and rests on him like a bird. The story is saying that God's Spirit is empowering Jesus to begin the new creation. And we see this happening when he heals people or forgives their sins. He's creating life where there once was death. Now, Israel's religious leaders oppose Jesus and they eventually have him killed. But even here, God's Spirit is at work. The earliest disciples of Jesus, who saw him alive from the dead, said it was God's energizing spirit that raised Jesus. This is the beginning of new creation. Yes, and it's still going. When Jesus appeared to his closest followers, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And soon after that, the Spirit powerfully comes on all of his disciples. So that they can become a part of this new creation and share the good news and learn how to live by the energy and influence of God's Spirit. And so today, the Spirit is still hovering in dark places. Yes, pointing people to Jesus, transforming and empowering them so they can love God and others. And the Christian hope is that the Spirit is going to finish the job. The story of the Bible ends with a vision of a new humanity, living in a new world that's permeated with God's love and life-giving spirit. Hey, thanks for watching this video on the Holy Spirit. I was so interested in the video, I forgot to fix my mic. Good morning. 
In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. The Hebrew is tovu avohu. It sounds, it's one of those words that sounds exactly like it is, full of chaos, empty, formless, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. I don't know about you, but the first passage of Scripture I think of when I think about the Holy Spirit is Pentecost. You know, where the tongues of fire come and um, the, the disciples can speak all these languages and 3,000 people come to faith. And the second is probably the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. All New Testament passages. When I, read through, when I read through John earlier this year, um, just those five chapters right before the Last Supper, I realized how much Jesus talks about the Holy Spirit during the Last Supper. And then I did a word search on the word mentioned in the video, ruach. Can you say that? You have mass, so you can just like really, and it catches it, you know. <laughs> ruach. Um, but it means breath, spirit, wind. It's mentioned 377 times in the Old Testament. And a lot of those times it's wind or breath or those types of things. But mercifully, because I was a little worried that I was going to need to look at all 377 to sort them all out, but there was an amazing commentary called Brown Driver Briggs, I'm assuming that's a commentary, divided all these occurrences of the word into categories. Wind, breath, and then which ones were the actual spirit of God. So I, I have to say up front that this topic has gotten me so excited about the Bible. I, I don't remember the last time I was so excited just to study. Normally, you know, my, my dilemmas of Bible reading are kind of like, okay, should I quit scrolling Instagram or quit this movie long enough to read my passage of Scripture for the day? You know, that's usually the, the dilemma. Can I turn off my distractions so that I can actually read Scripture? And I found myself yesterday afternoon really feeling pulled between, should I start my talk for tomorrow or finish working on the big picture study of the Holy Spirit, which was just a welcomed but strange phenomenon. Here's what's also incredible. So while my interest in the Holy Spirit had been growing, unbeknownst to me, my dad was in the middle of his own deep dive study into the book of Acts and into Pentecost. Cheryl Potter approached me just probably, I don't know, a month and a half ago, somewhere in there, and just said, hey, I've been um, reading these books by Jim, how do you say his last name? Symbola, and you know, I just, I really think our next series should be on the Holy Spirit. And I looked at her and I was like, Cheryl, that is so weird. I've been thinking something similar, but my thought was, I wish there was just one other leader that was having the same thought. And up walked Cheryl. And then, just as another, like, random thing, right before I walked up here, my mom said that the whole, uh, the Adventist review story was, the Spirit still speaks. <laughs> So, it's almost like the Holy Spirit was planning his own series. So, for the next five weeks before Easter, we are basically going to deep dive into the Old Testament and look at the five big categories of things, manifestations, actions, powers, that the Holy Spirit had in the Old Testament. Almost like a big Bible study. But, like, cancel all your weird associations you have with Bible study if you have those, because I think it's going to be really, really fun. Then we'll have Easter, and we'll talk for a while about what Jesus had to say about the Holy Spirit, and then we'll move into the Apostles, Pentecost, and the New Testament. And while telling these stories, we will also look back into recent history and current ways that the Spirit has moved throughout the world in the last couple of centuries and even today. And the thing is that this is honestly the least planned series that we've had since I've been here. Mostly because what we discover as we go will help us to determine where we go next. All I've discovered so far 
in this research is how much I do not know about the Holy Spirit and how low my expectations are compared to what the Bible says. So next week we jump right into the Old Testament and the Holy Spirit, but today is all about the invitation. Today is to get your mind thinking, your heart stirring for what's to come. We go back to the verse I read at the beginning, that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And the Ruach, the Spirit of God, was hovering over the waters. Now water is a theme with the Holy Spirit throughout the scriptures. Not every time the Spirit is mentioned, but a lot of the time. You think of Egypt, Israel, a lot of the setting of like the environment of the Bible is in the desert, in a place where without water there is death, which a couple of weeks ago would have been a very foreign concept to us here in the United States. But I know some of us, if you listen to Philip's morning meditation Wednesday, talked about freezing pipes and losing water here among us. If you've been watching the news at all, you've seen those terrible videos of all the pipes bursting in Texas and how a majority of the state has been out of water and power. I wonder if there's something to that metaphor of what our own spiritual life is like without the Spirit. Listen to what Isaiah says in Isaiah 44, verses 3 through 5. For I will pour water on the thirsty land, streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. I will spring up like grass in a meadow, like poplar trees by flowing streams. Some will say, I belong to the Lord. Others will call themselves by the name of Jacob's, and still other will write on their hand, the Lord's, Yahweh's, and I will take, and, and will take the name Israel. As we move through the prophets, Joel has more to say in one of the more famous verses about the Holy Spirit, keeping kind of with the water theme. And afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. On my servants, both men and women, what a radical idea now, but also especially in time Joel was alive, men and women having the spirit poured on them. I will pour out my spirit in those days, God said. And finally, the moment arrives that was prophesied when the spirit changes, and more will come on that. Um, what's the difference between the Holy Spirit and the Old Testament and the New Testament? I have some ideas, but again, we've got to study our way there. But the book of John, John verse 1, Verse 32 starts with John the baptizer giving this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him, Jesus. And I myself did not know on whom, did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me. So God told John the baptizer, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. An interesting parallel comes with this because just like at the very beginning where God's ruach is hovering over the water, creating order out of chaos at the very beginning of the world, so again, God's spirit is hovering over the water in the new thing that God is doing, in the new age that is coming, the age of Jesus, and he's going to create order out of the chaos that the world has become with the life of Jesus. And one of the first things right out of the gate that John says, that God tells John that Jesus will do is to baptize with the Holy Spirit. Is that not fascinating? It's like John wants you to ask when he's writing the biography right out of the question, whoa, what will this be like? What's baptism in the Spirit? And so John keeps telling the story. We go a couple um, chapters forward to John 4, and it's this strange story that we're used to, but when we really take it in context, it's, it's a weird story, where Jesus walks up to a Samaritan woman to draw water at the well, and Jesus says, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food, and the Samaritan woman said to him, she's kind of spunky, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For 
Jews do not associate with Samaritans. We have some segregation happening and Jesus just breaks the color line and is like, hey, can I get a drink of water from you? Sir, the, uh, Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that you asked for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. So she looks at him and says, sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well and drank from it himself as did his sons and his livestock? She's either really dense or pretty spunky. I, I think she's, personally, I think she's just kind of spunky. But Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water that I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So the woman says, sir, I can see that you're a prophet. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. She might as well have asked him a question like, hey Jesus, should we wear masks or not wear masks? Who's right, black or white, left or right? How politically charged was the question she was asking him? It was about race, it was about politics, it was about religion, it was a challenging question. And Jesus, like he always does, answers it without answering it. He says, woman, Jesus replied, believe me, the time is coming. It's a verse that, that Doug read earlier. Believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews, yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. So she asks him a question, hey, who's right, who's wrong, where do we worship, how do we do it, what does it look like, you know, how do we please everyone? How, what, what's the, I don't know if she's trying to trick him or just genuinely, like, concerned, what is the answer? And basically, Jesus gives her an answer about the kind of people they need to be. He doesn't give her an answer of what to do. He tells them they need to be a certain kind of people, the kind of people that worship in spirit and in truth. I wonder if there's anything there for us. The conversation goes on, and she ends up actually being the first person that Jesus tells that he is the Messiah. Can you imagine that? Have you thought about that? An unmarried, sexually active, biracial woman. Maybe the good news is for everyone. Which, it still seems like the author, John, really wants to spike your curiosity because you get that Jesus will baptize with the Holy Spirit. He tells you that right out of the gate. And now he's talking about living water and he says that he's the Messiah. But what exactly is that water and how do we worship in this way? What does it mean? How will this solve the problems of our time? Well, John will answer the question further in. John chapter 7, starting with verse 37. On the last day of the festival, Jesus stood up and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. John's finally about to tell us what we want to know because he says, By this he meant the Spirit whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. At the Last Supper, Jesus tells us more. In John chapter seven, 16, verses 7, Jesus tells his closest followers, but very truly I tell you, it is good for you that I am going away. Well, just let that sink in. Is that not shocking? Here you have Jesus healing people, um, paying attention to people that never get paid attention to, and he says to his closest friends, hey, it's going to be great that I'm going to go away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. 
When he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin, because people do not believe in me. About righteousness, because I'm going to the Father where you can see me no longer. About judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. Sounds like things that we want to know now. It sounds like the Holy Spirit brings conviction, brings faith, brings justice, brings the defeat of evil. Less than 24 hours later, Jesus is killed. And Sunday morning, out he comes in his first meeting with the disciples. Here he is talking about the Holy Spirit again. It's almost like the Holy Spirit is really, really important to Jesus. Because Jesus says, peace be with you. Hey guys, I'm back. As the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. And with that, he breathed, it's like Aslan in the Chronicles of Narnia, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. So in John's biography of Jesus' life, the Holy Spirit is very central from the beginning all the way to the end. In this inaugural moment when John the baptizer baptizes Jesus, God tells John the baptizer that Jesus will baptize people with the Holy Spirit. The night before he is killed, Jesus spends a huge chunk of his time telling the disciples about the advocate and what this advocate will do for them. And then at the end of the biography, when Jesus appears to his disciples for the first time after the resurrection, he says, receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit seems like a really important person to Jesus. I need some little helpers. Are there any kid helpers that would like to come help me? Any other helpers? Oh yeah, here's another helper. Oh, I see another helper. Lou, you wanna be my helper too? Okay, all right, let's sit right here. Okay, you guys ready? Here, you wanna sit on my lap? Here. Okay, so we are going to learn a new prayer, are you ready? And we're gonna teach all these people to do it too. Okay, yes, okay, palms up. Okay, repeat after me, are you ready? Okay. You can leave your eyes open or closed, whatever you wanna do. You say, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit. live in my heart. Give me love, joy, and peace. And help me do the right thing. Amen. Guys, that was awesome. Thank you so much. Okay, you can go back to your seats. Thanks for all your help. Here, go ahead, Fudgy. Isn't it wild how children will often do things that make us uncomfortable? You think, I think Jesus had something right when he said that we have to be like children when we approach him. Let's pray one more time. Jesus, we ask that you would give us the faith of children. We ask that you would teach us to open our hands, our hearts, our minds to your Holy Spirit, that as we go on this journey to learn about more of what you have for us in the Spirit, that um, we would press into our discomfort that we would have the courage to, to truly question our assumptions and um, the courage to really step out in faith and um, loosen our grip on the things that, that we really want to control and just surrender ourselves to you. Please uh, bless the rest of our time together and Holy Spirit come. Fletch and Fowl, we d learned that prayer. I can't exactly remember, um, but it, I've found myself when I just think about wanting, oh wait, I want to get my mind right. I'll find myself saying that little prayer to myself. Holy Spirit, live in my heart. <laughs> Give me love, joy, and peace. Help me do the right thing. The other night, Fallon, Shandy sent me a text and Fallon said, Holy Spirit, live in my heart. Thank you, God, for my family and friends. God, I like you. Amen. <laughs> really, that's all the prayers we need though, right? We make it much more complicated. You know, COVID has exposed a lot of things. I heard something early on in, um, in the pandemic from a pastor, and um, 
It was something like, COVID is an amplifier. If your marriage wasn't doing well before, or if you were experiencing abuse, then it probably got worse. There's also a lot of young families that have young kids or newborns who really enjoyed the extra time in their home. You can say that about a lot of things. It's exposed some systemic problems we have around race in this country. It seems to have fueled our political differences. At work, it's pushed us to our limits, and there's things that we've tried that we've been scared to do. When we see people exhausted from all the stresses of COVID and kids in school and just how crazy this last year is, and then they're working six-day weeks, we thought, hey, maybe we should try some alternative work schedules that we were too scared to try before. For me, it's really exposed how much I really want to make everyone happy. It's always been impossible, but it became very obvious this year that it truly is impossible to do. And for me, it's also exposed a lot of things about Compass that I knew, I think we knew, that we needed to work on, but I didn't know how, or maybe they weren't big enough issues until we're trying to navigate the things we're trying to na navigate. Things like having a vibrant community group life, being more than just a service. I know I, I mentioned it last month, but the Dietrich Bonhoeffer quote really, really hit me. I just want to read it again. It is not we who build. Christ builds the church. Whoever is mindful to build the church is surely well on, its, on the way to destroying it. For he will build, or us, when we do that, we build a temple of idols without wishing or knowing it. We must confess he builds. We must proclaim he builds. We must pray to him and he will build. We do not know his plan. We cannot see whether he is building or pulling down. It may be that the times by which human standards are the times of collapse are for him the great times of construction. We've seen the stats in church attendance. In actuality, our, you know, 50 to 60 percent attendance rates are high compared to national church attendance race, r rates, or even rates of churches in the area. Church attendance is just down. A recent study showed that 70 percent of pastors in the study were looking for other jobs because they were so burned out and so discouraged. Bonhoeffer goes on, it may be that the times from which a human point are great times for the church are times when it is pulled down. Oh, the Christian leaders that we have watched fall this year. Carl Lentz, John Ortberg, and most recently Ravi Zacharias. Ty Gibson had an amazing thought about the whole Ravi Zacharias situation. If you're interested, just later to Google or look up, he had an amazing um, some amazing thoughts on how people can still be led to the gospel through dysfunctional people. Thank the Lord, right? Dietrich goes on, it is such a great comfort which Jesus gives to his church. You confess, preach, bear witness to me, and I alone will build where it pleases. Do not meddle in what is not your providence. Do what is given to you and do it well, and you will have done enough. Live together in the forgiveness of your sins. Forgive each other every day from the bottom of your hearts. There's this um, divide in kind of the Western church, but really, honestly, it's the American church. There's what we call, you know, Holy Spirit churches and Bible churches. You know what I'm talking about? It's like the, the, the charismatic Holy Spirit churches and kind of the, uh, the stereotype or stigma is like, A, they write very great worship songs, <laughs> and they usually have great media, great output, um, but then maybe there's some stuff that's kind of weird and makes us uncomfortable, and a lot of times they kind of have this reputation of, really being light on theology and heavy on the worship, right? If you're just going to make some generalizations. Then we have Bible churches, which I would think our church typically falls in that category. 
by our church, I mean like the Adventist tradition, um, more recently falls in that category. And the joke about those churches is that they are all about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Bible. <laughs> because while we say that we believe in the Holy Spirit, we kind of just want them to stay there. And like we're all, we're down with like the like love, joy, peace part of it, but we're really a little bit scared about the the, you know, the tongues, the deliverance, the heals, and the healings, and the, the, all that, that, you know, it just, eh. let's, let's just, like, focus on the Bible, and so, those are very big generalizations, um, but what's interesting is that when you read the Bible, the Bible does not have those separated. There are not Bible churches and Holy Spirit churches, the, the, the ideal church has both. And there's a lot of churches actually, not in the U.S., but even um, in like England, Scotland, and those areas that d have not had that divide. They see moves of the Spirit, but they very highly value the Bible, have strong theology, and also experience more of the Holy Spirit. And I, while I have felt this for a while, this last year has really got me wanting to make that move as a church. Not that, I, I think we do a wonderful job, it's in our mission statement, to be biblically true. And I think we do that, I think we worship, I think we've done so much with Compass, and I want more. And, and really, to be biblically true, we all want to want more. Now, some of you, and I, I don't, maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think there's a bunch of you, but, but there might be some of you who've been involved in a, in a charismatic church in the past, and you're just like, yeah, I was there, and they put that black blanket over you, and it was super weird, and I, please tell me Compass is not going that direction. <laughs> I've seen that on TV, and usually they're taking your money, and I, uh, are we doing that? So, if there's those of you out there, I want to say I see you. If there's, some of you have kind of those, like, um, is it called cessationist, you know? Like, that believe that the Holy Spirit just moved in the apostles, and then afterwards it's like he kind of went away and doesn't really do stuff anymore. And so there's some of you who have like gotten really tired of that and you're like, yes, thank God, we're gonna go toward that, like Holy Spirit come, like can I bring my tambourines and my flags and you know, whatever, like I just, I'm so excited about this and there might be a few of you out there. But most of us are probably like, sure, yeah, I don't know, I mean, I think I believe in the Holy Spirit and this sounds interesting. Um, there was a, a story that John Mark Homer told in a sermon I listened to his last week about the Holy Spirit, um, how when their church was talking about wanting to really have, have more of the Holy Spirit, one of the elders came up to him and was just like, I already have the Spirit. Like, what does having more look like? Why would I want that? <laughs> you know, which is a great, honest question, right? Like, that's a great question. And... Um, one of the first things that I thought made sense is when we think spirit, we kind of like think of, of, of it as an it, you know, like it's just out here. What's so interesting when Jesus talks about the spirit, he uses the pronoun he, which really means that it is a person. And with a person, are you ever done knowing a person? John Mark told this really funny story, and if I had my own, I would tell it too, but it made me laugh, and I thought it was such a good example, but he talked about when he and his wife were dating, they decided not to kiss until they got engaged, and so a few years in, he goes, he proposes, and she says yes, and he's like, you know what this means? And so he goes in for the kiss, and it was horrible. He said, they knocked teeth, it, it was terrible. And so he said, now what would happen if I had just been like, awesome, I got her. She agreed to marry me and I had my first kiss. I'm done getting to know my wife. He's like, he and he was homeschooled and he's like, you would all say you have been homeschooled way too long, dude. 
<laughs> because there's more, right? There's more. And he talked about how that, you know, they'd been married, I think, 15, 16 years at the time. And he's like, I learn things new about my wife every day. We learn how to be a better couple, have a better relationship every day. And that's where I think our challenge is with the Holy Spirit. I'm not saying we don't have the Holy Spirit. That's not what, I, that's not what I'm trying to say. I think we do. The amount of times, just ask the worship team and the teaching team, the amount of times that, like this time we all actually tried and made a concerted effort to have everything kind of agree, you know? Like the children's story, like there's a theme. I hope you got it, yeah? Okay, there's a theme. But you would be shocked at how many times that has happened on accident. On how many times the song is perfect, the, it all ties together and literally no person was coordinating but I would say the Holy Spirit. We have amazing stories of getting this building, of getting our last church building, of just incredible stories um, of the things that the Holy Spirit, I think, has led us and, and taken us. And so I, what I don't want you to hear me say is that I don't think that we have or believe in the Holy Spirit. I'm not saying that. What I am saying is that I think most of us, if not all of us, would say that we believe in the Holy Spirit. We're not like, no, the Holy Spirit doesn't do anything. But... What if, what I am proposing is what if we're sort of like John Mark after the first kiss with his wife, and we're kind of like, eh, we got it. That's it. What if we're a little more that? And what would it be like to go deeper, to get to know the Spirit better? A lot of times, I don't know about you, like I'll read these stories in the Bible about the Spirit, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, I totally believe that. That's so cool. I can't believe that happened. Like, but that's amazing how God did that. And then I'll hear like a story that's almost a mirror version of that Bible story where the Holy Spirit did something wild or like there was a healing or, you know, like a prophecy or whatever. And I'm like, ooh, I'm really suspicious that that, eh. anyone else kind of have that feeling of like, oh, that seems, I'm not sure. My first, my first feeling, to be honest with you, is usually suspicion. I remember um, when I lived in Chattanooga, some of my friends were going to this church downtown and they were like, wow, it's so crazy. There's like healings and there's all this stuff. And my thought was like, I am never going to go with y'all to that church. <laughs> I'm like, that sounds really weird. Like they're telling me these stories. And I'm just being transparent with you. And I hope that that resonates with some of you because I just want to say that, that my first thoughts are often suspicion when I hear of miraculous things. But I, I have a growing cognitive dissonance, that I believe what the Bible says, and then I feel deep suspicion. Anyone else in the same boat with me? You're like, yeah, I believe that, but do I? <laughs> you know, I have this thing going back and forth. And so I want to be uncomfortable. I've decided that. I would really like to, to make myself more uncomfortable in this area. I want you to be uncomfortable. Because you know another word for that? Faith. Stepping out in faith is uncomfortable. I want to challenge my thinking. I want to challenge our thinking as a church. Literally, a huge part of this series is that I want, if you do not have that cognitive dissonance right now, I want to create it in our hearts and minds. This is what the Bible says about the Holy Spirit, and this is what the Holy Spirit is doing in lots of places in the recent past, even in our own church history, and even in other church histories, and even now, and I say that I believe the Bible, yet I am weirded out by the stories, no matter what time period they're in. If they're not in the Bible, I'm kind of like, mm. So am I saying that I hope that we just like start seeing visions and dreams and prophecies and tongues and healings and visions and deliverance? Or maybe I'm saying something more safe, like, oh, okay, I hope we have just, you know, some more of the fruits of the Spirit, a little more unity, a little more love, kindness. We could all use some more of that. Kind of some clarity of direction, maybe a building upgrade, just, you know, those littler Holy Spirit things. The answer is yes, and I don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> and honestly, I do not think that we can know. We can only become more open to the Spirit and see what happens. We can only go through this study. We can only look at what the Bible says, look at our experience, and compare. And that's really hard. Because it involves letting go of control. I, I procrastinated do, putting together this series until, get this, another Holy Spirit thing, five people asked me, 
on leadership at Compass on Monday, which just so you all know, usually this happens like Thursday night, Friday night, or Saturday morning. Monday, hey, what's the teaching on so that we can build the series around that? And no one, like that was weird. That's what got me to do the series because normally when we put the series out, I want to have like, is it going to be six weeks? Is it going to be 12 weeks? I want to have all the topics out. People signed up way down the road. And this, is, this just wasn't coming out like that because I don't know where it's going to go. I don't think we know where it's going to go. I have, we have the next five weeks planned out. What I do know is that a lot of things in our world seem really broken. Human kindness seems to be one of them. The more time I spend on social media, at least. I was reading a book on Martin Luther King Jr. to Fletch and Fowl last Sunday. And I had read the book earlier because I was trying to see if it was, you know, like appropriate for their age. And anyway, I couldn't make it through the book without weeping, trying to explain to them things that happened to this man while Miss Kay was a little girl. And they still happen. I felt a deep anger yesterday, which I realized upon reflection this morning, was really sadness at how people are talking about Texas. The left is saying, you know, Texas is dumb for having its own power grid, and why is Ted Cruz going to the beach? And then the right is saying everything, everything from the government-generated storms that created this, and, you know, wind power being the problem, and how Joe and Kamala have done nothing. Meanwhile, the people in Texas are still freezing and still don't have water. And we're over here playing Adam, looking for Eve, who to blame, and we haven't even addressed the issue. I feel stressed because at Core Team this week, we're going to talk about our COVID response again. And I'm anxious because I feel like no matter what we do, some of you feel like you can't come to church here. And I hate that. I hate it so much. It breaks my heart, and I, I, it feels like a false ultimatum that whatever you do, you're going to lose people. All of these situations feel so far out of my control, and I am exhausted of trying to control them. And I keep having the thought, we are followers of Jesus, and we must be better than this. There has to be more. What about you? Are you ready to surrender your semblance of control. Because I think this last year, even this last week, has affirmed that indeed it really is a semblance. We don't have control of the air we breathe, the water, the gas, the electricity, fire, weather, our food supply, and most certainly other people's thoughts and feelings and ideas. Isn't that a disappointment? (laughs) Are you ready to loosen your grip on things you cannot even hold? Are you ready to say, Holy Spirit, I would rather have you than all of my answers? Are you thirsty? The invitation of Jesus could not be clearer. Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. And later on he said, receive the Holy Spirit.
Jesus, so often I feel like the man that came to you asking to heal his son. Lord, if there's anything you can do for my son, please do it. And you said, if there's anything I can do, anything is possible for those who believe. And the man replied, I believe, help my unbelief. And Holy Spirit, I don't know about the other people in this room, but that is so often how I feel about you. I believe, help my unbelief. I ask that you would, like, so, like David so eloquently prayed this morning, not only fill this space, but fill our hearts. That you would soften our minds, you would soften our hearts, that you would raise our eyes, raise our thinking to things above. If we look around us, there's no end to things that we can find that are wrong with the world or that we wish were different or problems that clearly seem to not have a solution. And so, Lord, we just ask that you would raise our eyes. As we go through this series, as we go through this study, that you would make a way for us. That you would open us to you. In your name, amen. Hey, if you want to go deeper in this series, there's a whole page on our website. We'll post it on Facebook and, and things. Um, but it has podcasts, it has books, it has playlists, the Bible Project movie you saw earlier. Um, lots of resources where you can really dive in and, and explore and listen. Um, all that, to, if, if you're feeling nerdy like I have in this series, you're welcome to do that. If, oh, there's also playlists, so you don't have to be nerdy, you can just like music. So um, check that out. But all that knowledge, while helpful and can be interesting, the best thing that you can do is as children do, as we did this morning. You want to practice one more time? Nobody? Do you know? I know you know this. Holy Spirit, live in my heart. Give me love, joy, and peace, and help me do the right thing. Amen. Happy Sabbath, everybody.
think we've ever done a slower spot. 